good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Top 10 Expert Deposition Mistakes, an interactive webinar designed to help expert witnesses understand the depositions more fully and work more efficiently with attorneys. During the presentation, our panelists will cover the following. Not understanding the whole theory of the case, why it is important to find you, why it is important for you and your client. Incomplete CV, if you wrote it, list it, because they will find it. Knowing and communicating the, to the audience, let's get third grade for 20 minutes. Bad deposition manners, smug, rude, loud, and angry. Refusing to answer hypotheticals on cross. Squirming on fee questions. Don't worry, you're worth it, aren't you? Unbalanced expert history, plaintiff v. defense. Confessing your skeletons or why Facebooks can be as bad as a conviction. Dalbert who? Opinion, real, opinion issues and junk science. Educating attorney. What I'm really saying is our presenters for this webinar are Craig Heideman and Nathan Duncan. Mr. Heideman is a shareholder at Douglas Hahn and Heideman PC. Mr. Heideman's practice is limited to serious personal injury claims, wrongful death, class action, civil rights, pharmaceutical products liability, felony and misdemeanor criminal defense. Throughout his practice, he has recovered significant dollar settlements and judgments for his clients. Mr. Duncan is an associate at Douglas Hahn and Heideman. Mr. Duncan attended law school at the University of Missouri, Columbia, where he earned his JD degree in 2007. Mr. Duncan is a member of the 30th Judicial Circuit Bar Association and the Missouri Bar. He is also admitted to practice before the U.S. Court, Western District of Missouri. This webinar will be divided up into six sessions. Uh, currently, we are taking care of the introduction after which time Craig and Nathan will present the content of the course. At about 2.20 p.m., we'll open it up for a Q&A session. We'll then have another presentation of content from Craig and Nathan. After that, we'll have one more Q&A session before Craig and Nathan wrap things up. The panelists today have done their best to incorporate the questions that were sent in by attendees prior to the presentation. If you have a question that pertains to the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A feature, which is located on the right-hand side of the screen. I've highlighted it with my red pointer that says Matt High. The panelists will do their best to answer your questions. Approximately one hour after the event, we will send out an email with a link to an archived recording of the webinar. And we do ask you that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar is over. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. I will now turn it over to our distinguished panelists, Craig and Nathan. All right, good afternoon. We're going to be uh, loading up the PowerPoint presentation. Matt's just turned over control of the webinar to us, and it's, uh, it's getting ready to load right up. Um, Matt, can you hear us? I can, yes. Okay, good. We had a little X by the telephone there, and I think maybe that just means that we've got control of it, right? Yeah? Yeah, I'm sorry. One of you was on hold, so that's why we have the X. Um, I hear your hold music from your office. so. Um, but I can hear you now fine. Okay. All right. Well, just to make sure, if anybody else is having trouble hearing, just uh, send a quick note in, and we'll... Uh, we'll uh, Philip Shalen saying sound. Uh, is anybody else having any sound problems? Okay, we're going to move forward then. Uh, we're going to talk about the top, the top ten uh, deposition mistakes, how to identify and how to avoid them. We've tried to make it kind of fun, uh, but covering else, covering all of the topics uh, that we want to cover, we're going to have to move at a pretty good pace. And we've tried to incorporate, like Matt said, all of the questions that uh, the experts sent in before we got started. Uh, the first one, the first thing we wanted to do was just kind of briefly cover what is a deposition and what you can expect. Uh, 
generally a deposition is a question and answer period where attorneys uh, get to ask you as an expert witness uh, a broad range of questions that may or may not pertain to the loss that you've been hired to render an opinion in. They're huge in scope with limited exceptions. Attorneys can ask you anything they want. Uh, uh, when your wife was born, what your children's social security numbers are, and if you understand that, not, not that they'll ask you that in every case, but if you understand that, you won't look to your attorney that's putting you forward for deposition and say, um, you know, what uh, do I have to answer that? Generally, you're going to have to answer all questions unless you hear your attorney use the magic words, do not answer the question. Uh, we as attorneys are limited into the types of questions that, that we can ask or that we can, that we can object to. And those typically deal with the way that the other attorney has formed their question. So typically, uh, you know, questions about what kind of sh what your uh, wife's favorite shoes are, while probably not relevant to the case, uh, they may get in during the deposition. There's four goals to a deposition. Well, first of all, there's two types of depositions. Maybe the attorney that's hired you is going to take your deposition so that you don't have to appear at trial. That's one type of deposition. We're going to be focusing in large part today upon uh, the depositions where the other side is going to notice you for deposition so that he can either preserve your testimony, pin you down on what your opinions are, discover how you arrived at your opinions, or perhaps to impeach you because he has a nugget or a, of impeaching information or, in some cases, a boulder of impeaching information. So generally that's what, what depositions are. Uh, so let's jump into some of the mistakes that occur during deposition. Uh, the first one we thought of was that sometimes expert witnesses don't get a broad view of the case. They may not fully understand uh, what that theory uh, may be. So as an expert witness, you need to really strive to get a big picture of the case and where your opinion may fit into that. Here's a for instance. Let's say that you're an engineer and you've been hired to offer an opinion on the design of an injury-producing piece of machinery and you form the opinion that the uh, uh, machinery is not effectively designed, but the attorney is going to defend the case under a theory that uh, the, the, not only was it not effectively designed, but it was improperly maintained. Well, if you are the expert and you determine that there are issues that if any of the, the called out maintenance steps are skipped, it becomes unreasonably dangerous, that might be information that it would be very good to uh, uh, share with your uh, hiring attorney so that he can he can integrate that in the uh, into the theory of the case. Uh, several people in the pre-submitted questions uh, they ask about whether it would be appropriate to get a, a timeline from the from the attorney that hired you, and that is a that is a very effective way for you to get the big picture. If the attorney has prepared a timeline, which many do, uh, I think that would be a perfectly appropriate request to make so that you can incorporate your opinion into that bigger picture. The privilege issues vary from state to state in that if the attorney provides it to you, it may be discoverable by the other side. So depending on your state or jurisdiction's privilege laws, that may be something that he'd like to do, but he might not want to do. But certainly you can talk about it, and you can uh, uh, use that information to form your opinions upon, or to base your opinions upon. All right, so let's move to mistake number two, prior publications. And Craig had an interesting experience with this. Well, uh, a lot of times on your CV, uh, we, we assume that some of them are, you know, that are 30 or 40 pages long, that maybe the other side won't take the time to, to pull your publications and see what you've had to say. We had a case where uh, uh, we had a, a product liability case and we had claimed mental injury and the other side sent our client out to an independent medical examination by a psychiatrist and she wrote on her CV that she wrote a book called Welcome Silence and that was seemed innocuous enough and we took the time and pulled all of her publications, and it turned out that the complete title of the book was Welcome Silence, My Triumph Over Schizophrenia, realizing that the scientific community generally regards schizophrenia as an incurable disease. It kind of uh, caused us pause that this particular expert didn't really find that the state of the art with regard to schizophrenia was really anything that applied to her, that perhaps the scientific method was optional, and we were able to, uh, we believe, do a good job in uh, uh, discrediting her as an expert in this particular case just because of what the, the position that she took in her prior publication. So just assume that if you list it, the other attorney is going to probably obtain it and hopefully read it if they're doing their job, uh, but you do need to list them all. And that's one of the lessons that 
one of the keys to this prior publication issue is is list them all because even even if you don't list them, uh, some poor associate stuck in a cubicle is going to be tasked with tracking down stuff that you've published. Uh, many of you experts have practiced in your fields for a long time and have published extensively. So you may have published an article 20 years ago that either you don't, you know, you're you're not as familiar with as you could be, uh, or you've just forgotten about it. You need to make sure that you're familiar with those so that if there's something that could be problematic with your opinion, then uh, you can deal with those at deposition. You know, I said earlier impeaching information, and if you have a prior publication that is uh, uh, contrary to or not um, consistent with the opinions that you're offering, that can be the kind of some kind of impeaching information that they can use to discredit your opinions. Prior publications can be impeaching. They can also be, they can also buttress your opinion. So, uh, it's good to list them even if they're in a different area than what your current opinion is on. And impeaching information would be uh, stuff that would discredit uh, discredit your opinion in some way. So it, it, when you listen, uh, when you list those things, you need to be very, uh, very detailed and include stuff like uh, speaking engagements. If you gave a presentation to the Rotary Club on a particular topic, then uh, you should include that. The other attorneys will find those. We had a dental negligence case recently where we found one of the, the critical pieces of information that we used uh, in an expert deposition against the expert by a presentation that she did at a Rotary Club, and we found it online. It wasn't anything that was listed, and then we were able to go back and direct discovery to her and get her notes and find out that uh, the information that she was giving us was completely inconsistent with what she said in this public meeting. So listing your speaking engagements is also very important. And be familiar with your prior, your opinions and prior court cases. Those prior cases are, you have to disclose them under Rule 26 in federal cases. So keep that in mind. There are banks and banks of databases that contain depositions of, of uh, expert witnesses from coast to coast. So if you did give a deposition in another court case, you have to assume that the other side is going to find out about it. All right. Uh, mistake number three, uh, mind your manners. There are some basic things that uh, will go a long way towards um, boosting your credibility during your deposition. Uh, one of the first ones is interrupting. Sometimes we as attorneys ask very easy questions. You guys are experts in your field. Uh, you're obviously very intelligent. So you may know the answer to the question before we finish it up. But uh, wait for the attorney to get the question out of his, his or her mouth and then proceed to answer. It creates a cleaner record. Uh, from a frequency standpoint, this is probably the m most frequently occurring problem with expert witnesses, either that we put forth for deposition or that we depose, um, and we'd encourage you to take note of that. It, it makes you uh, it makes the record far easier to read, and it makes you uh, a, a far more marketable expert. Uh, the other thing is, is you know, experts are generally very smart. They've got a lot of experience in their field, and and, and nine times out of ten, uh, they are smarter than the expert or than the attorney that's deposing them. But you don't want that attitude to come across. Many expert depositions are going to be videotaped, and the jury's going to be seeing you, and they'll be able to gauge and key on your attitude that you're you're putting forward. So we want to make sure that humility. Uh, you know, abound, abides in the deposition. A little bit of humility will increase your credibility. And yes, amen. Sorry, talking too fast is another problem. Uh, we may be guilty of that today. We're trying to cover a lot of ground, but uh, we want to make sure that you take time, you talk slowly, because talking too fast has two problems in a deposition. Court reporters will do their best to take down what you say, but we've had many occasions where critical words that make the difference between an opinion going one way or another are taken down incorrectly by a court reporter, and we believe it's often because either the answers are given too fast. Uh, next matter you can mind, uh, careful how you answer your questions. Uh, there may be a temptation, and this particularly is a problem when you're being cross-examined. Uh, as we tell all of our witnesses, whether they're experts or our clients, as we're preparing them for deposition, that uh, they need to be careful when they're answering only to answer the questions that, ask, that is asked. So um, you don't want to ramble on. Even though you may have an opinion that you really want to get out there, if you're being cross-examined, it, it does not always help you to just to blurt that out. It may... Uh, uh, Cross may diminish your credibility. Cross-examination is an opportunity for you to answer questions, not 
tell everything that you know about the facts of the case. Generally speaking, if you've given more than uh, three sentences of testimony, you might think if it would be appropriate for you to to uh, kind of um, uh, conclude on that particular topic, and that would prompt the other attorney to ask you another question if he needed to know more. The old adage holds true here, you know, if they ask you what time it is, don't tell them how to build the watch. Um, that leads us uh, to our last topic in minding your manners, losing your temper. Um, I'm always amazed how many times experts, either my own or other other attorneys' experts, will lose their temper. Obviously, and that all that does is is it gets you off track, and uh, it it kind of brings emotions into into the deposition, which really don't need to be there. So just uh, don't let anybody get your goat, and uh, just remember we're we're just there to answer questions truth, truthfully. All right, number four, uh, it has to do with fee issues. This can be a sensitive subject for expert witnesses, but it shouldn't be. Uh, when you set your prices, you have a reason for doing that. And when another attorney asks you about those prices, there's no need to waffle or to squirm, just uh, like we have on the slide here. Say it loud and say it proud. Don't apologize for it. We, we talked about this last month uh, when we talked about fee issues. You, you should comparatively set your fees. You should charge what you're worth, and uh, you shouldn't apologize for it. We had a case uh, a year or so ago where an expert, uh, he charged more to have a defendant take his deposition than if a plaintiff took his deposition, and he, and he was able to. Well, it was quite a bit more. I mean, it wasn't a small amount. When the other attorney brought this up in deposition, uh, he, he just told it like it was. He said, this is why I do it, this is how much I charge, and that's it. And really, it left the, uh, you know, it tug of war, it kind of left the, he just let go of the rope, and uh, the attorney was left there with nowhere to go, so that was the end of the inquiry. So it was very effective for him just to say, this is what I charge, and this is why I charge it. It didn't make the opposing counsel any happier, but uh, it certainly got him through with that line of questioning sooner. So uh, we won't spend much more time on that other than uh, be proud of what you charge, you're worth it. Another big mistake that is made by expert witnesses frequently is not knowing the audience you're speaking to. Uh, typically in the deposition, uh, if it, it, it may come up later at trial. So your, te your testimony at deposition will be heard either by uh, judge or jury, and they will be the ones making the decision. So uh, you want to keep in mind that members of the jury are not going to, may not speak some of that technical jargon that you know from your field. You know, we found, remember back to the slide one, you've got two kinds of depositions. One when the attorney that's retained you is deposing you, or perhaps one when the other side is deposing you. We need to use the same kind of language, whether we're being cross-examined on direct by our attorney or on cross-examination. I'm often amazed by attorneys that are, by experts that will use this wonderful, uh, um, um, common, third grade level language and explaining things on direct, but then on cross-examination they turn into an unintelligible uh, uh, technocrat and, and they, they say things in such a way that, that if the jury were hearing that, they, they really would be put off by it. We want to be consistent in using the appropriate language, whether we're, you're, we're being direct, examined on direct or on cross. So when you do that, I mean... If you can use basic terms and basic concepts, that's much more effective when speaking to the jury, jury than using a technical word. Like, uh, you know, we have a doctor, you don't want to talk about an endogastroduodenoscopy when you can just say, I was trying to, you know, we had to place a tube down their throat uh, to uh, help with, with breathing. Uh, the second way is much more effective, and the jury will definitely understand you better. And, uh, you know, we also want to take into account that the average attention span, studies show, of a juror is about 20 minutes for any particular witness. So if you're giving uh, direct testimony for your attorney and you have opinions to offer, you need to consider how you can front load the important stuff in the first 20 minutes so that it will be, it will be retained by the jurors uh, when they go back into the jury room a day or a week or two days later, uh, depending on how long the case is. Well, that's an important point, Craig, because uh, on direct examination, the attorney asking you questions may leave them a little more open-ended and allow you more leeway in, uh, in in talking about your opinion, so you'll have a better opportunity to 
uh, explain yourself in those first 20 minutes than if you would on cross-examination. Some depositions are recorded by video, um, and on video recordings, um, you have to not only mind kind of what you're wearing and how you look that day, but how you give your answers. In a written deposition, if you take five minutes between a question and an answer to look through your papers to maybe find out what your opinion is on a particular issue, that's not going to show up in the deposition. But on video, if you do that, it's going to look like you didn't know the answer off the top of your head, you searched through some documents, and then after reviewing some papers, you were able to testify. So consider your audience, whether it's uh, 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 going to be a written deposition or a video deposition. All right, we're going to jump in. We're halfway through the mistakes. We're going to jump into a little Q&A. we got some great questions uh, from folks ahead of time. Uh, one of these is from uh, uh, I got an expert named Jack, and he asked that uh, he made a point that lawyers tend to ask rhetorical questions with built-in answers, uh, and he wondered if that was okay. Uh, and, you know, our thought is that uh, the questions will be uh, rhetorical only if the attorney is doing their job right. Uh, and that's specifically on cross-examination. Uh, you know, we're trained on cross to ask what are called leading questions where the answer is implied. So uh, it may be uncomfortable for you, uh, but you need to answer it uh, the, the way that uh, that it's posed. A lot of experts really, they, they think that they shouldn't answer yes to an obvious question if it's leading, that maybe they should try and find a way out of it. But experts can look evasive if they refuse to admit the obvious. If a question has, uh, the, if you have the ability to give a yes or no answer, give it. If the attorney is not, is, is is leaving out necessary premises or, or is uh, is missing the point or is, is, is asked something that isn't true, then, of course, you, you just say no. And then if he says why, you can explain. But don't be afraid to give a yes or no answer to a question that can be answered succinctly. Another question by Drusilla, she says, uh, how do you handle an overly friendly opposing attorney at a deposition? Well, I assume that uh, the attorney wants to be chit chatty, that she means that that he's uh, you know or she is 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 uh, very very likable, etc. And I think my first reaction was the shark may smile at you, but he's still going to eat you. Be careful not to engage in in friendly banter uh, beyond being merely courteous with. Uh, the attorney that's examining you because it can lead you into saying some things that you wouldn't otherwise say. The other part of her question was, how do you handle an overly combative one? Well, we want to make sure that your attorney that's putting you forth makes sure that everybody uh, minds their manners and isn't rude or abusive to you. So we would say if they were being overly combative that you might take a break and speak with the attorney that's hired you to, to perhaps ask the other side to treat you in a civil and uh, professional manner. Don't try and Fix that problem yourself. Um, Elon just sent a, uh, uh, a live question, I guess, following up on that delay issue. Um, Elon said that, uh, you know, on, on during depositions, there's a uh, – Elon makes a uh, – there's a, a delay for every answer so that there's no, it doesn't give a clue about how much that Elon really needs to think about. Um, wondered if that was a good approach. It may be, uh, but you want to watch how much time you're spending on that delay if you're doing it after every question because it could, I mean, you run the risk of being annoyed. If, if it's an obvious question and you still make that pause, the jury or judge is going to say, I mean, that's an easy question. Why don't you just answer it? So you need to make sure you balance that, you know, that delay with, uh, with, the, with your good manners, I guess, in deposition. Uh, one other question that we got was from... Um uh, don't see a first name, uh, Michelle, she's a nurse, a PhD, and she said, you know, oftentimes attorneys make a big deal that I'm a nurse and can't offer opinions on medical doctors, and, and she talks about collaborative standards of care, but they make a big deal about it. Uh, you know, I tell you what, if your attorney's putting you forward for deposition because you, because you have an opinion, then obviously it's going to meet the standards of reliability or or uh, you being in a similar specialty and being able to offer opinions on it, I wouldn't worry about it. I think that if the uh, other attorney is making a big deal about it, uh, they might not know that, in fact, your your opinion is going to um, be sufficient, legally sufficient, in the jurisdiction that you're offering the opinion in. Obviously, it's going to be up to the trier of fact, in this case a jury, to decide how much weight to give your, your opinions if you're not a medical doctor and you're trying to say that there was a surgical mistake. But... Uh, I certainly wouldn't worry about it too much. Well, and Michelle had a, had a second question. She uh, she 
lived in a different area where she was a different uh, state than where she was called to testify and was worried that um, that the opposing attorney might try and uh, make her seem like some big city expert and that she didn't fit in with the uh, the place where she was called to testify. Um, you know, she, that's probably more of an issue for the attorney to deal with uh, than, than you as an expert witness. Uh, the advice that I would give Michelle would be, you know, put forth your opinion, uh, do it competently, do it, you know, avoid the mistakes we're talking about today, and let the attorney deal with these other issues about, you know, how you're portrayed as an expert witness. We have, uh, as far as geographical areas, we had a case where uh, uh, we hired a Texas expert to give an opinion on Missouri negligence, and they said, well, you don't know what the standard of care is in Missouri, and uh, the expert handled it very well, said it doesn't matter what state you're in, uh, the standard of care for this is the same, you know. Uh, this is how you do it. Uh, we talk about it nationally all the time. So ge geography can kind of come into play that way. The only other thing I'd tell Michelle was, uh, you know, if you're from New York and uh, you enjoy going to Fashion Week, don't wear your your uh, Armani business suit to come to trial in central Missouri. Uh, just kind of know your, know your audience. All right, we're going to jump back into mistake number six. And that's not educating the attorney on what your opinion really is. As attorneys, we hate surprises. The only surprise I really like is my Christmas gift, and I don't even really like that surprise that much. We don't want to learn for the first time what your opinion is at either our deposition or on cross-examination by the other side. And, and a lot of times you'll draft an initial report or initial opinion after reviewing some facts. You'll think about it. You'll review some other depositions. You'll review discovery. Um, and you need to communicate what your opinion is if it changes or if your bases change. Um, and that involves supplementation. Right. In, in many jurisdictions, as part of, your duty, part of your duties as an expert witness, you're called on to prepare written reports. And those reports or the opinions you, you, uh, you render in those reports may change based on facts that may be discovered, uh, you know, through interrogatories or requests for production that the, that the attorney sends out. Well, when those things come in and you, you alter your opinion, you need, to make, you need to make sure that your reports are supplemented so that the attorney has an idea of what changes uh, have been made. The other thing is, we put this note, timing, don't waste time. Your, your deposition, while important, there are obviously things that need to take place before that. If you're unable to render your opinion with, uh, with certainty until either, you know, somebody else is deposed, uh, other documents are gathered, make sure you tell your attorney that. Uh, there's a, it would be a huge waste of time for you to go to deposition and then to say, look, I can't uh, offer my opinion because I haven't got this or I don't know what this guy's going to say. could be as simple as this. Let's say that you've looked at some police reports or uh, regarding an accident or a death and you've formed certain opinions. Uh, and you write a report, and they want to take your deposition, but you know before you go to trial you need to visit the scene, and you need to maybe measure the coefficient of drag on the roadway, or you need to take some measurements or photographs. Uh, don't offer or, or make sure you tell your attorney, hey, we really shouldn't do this now because I've got a little bit more work to do, and even though my opinions aren't going to change, I need to shore up the bases upon which I base my opinion. So that's why we want to make sure that your deposition is timed after you have all of your facts. Or there is a risk that your, your opinion could change uh, if you are missing a key piece of information. All right, on to number seven, the skeleton. We, our, go ahead, Craig, sorry. We've all got some skeletons in our closet, I imagine, if we're human beings. And in, in the arena of litigation, the other side is unusually motivated to find out what yours are. So the best defense to this is simply to tell the truth, and that begins with your attorney, your hiring attorney. Uh, you need to disclose anything that may come up, as embarrassing as it is, you need to make sure they know so that they can deal with it uh, prior to deposition or at deposition. It could be something as simple as a, a criminal conviction for driving while intoxicated. Studies have shown you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the adult population has had one. If you, do, if you have a criminal conviction, you should tell the attorney that's uh, hired you about it because it may come up at deposition. In today's day and age, the skeletons may come in the form of technology. You know, a lot of people have Facebook pages, MySpace, Twitter, LinkedIn, blogs, and websites. All these things are potential minefields for you. If you've made certain statements on these web pages, uh, you need to be mindful of those. They are archived. Uh, attorneys will find them, 
and uh, they will shove them in your face if they can harm your opinion in any way. Uh, somebody said in one of the pre-webinar uh, questions, well, my, my settings are private, so nobody can see them. What, what about that? Is that okay? Well, actually, if, if we as attorneys ask the attorney that's hired you, hey, we want your, your experts, MySpace entry or MySpace entries or Facebook entries for this point in time, they may have to provide them, or if you refuse to give them, find another expert, thereby putting you out of business. So we generally take the position that if you say it on the Internet, you may have to produce it. So be very mindful of that. And a cool tool that you can use for monitoring what is out there on the web about you, uh, I learned this at another uh, at CLE, uh, is Google Alerts has this function, where, and I've set this up, where you can, uh, you can type your name in, and Google will send you an email daily or however frequently you want it uh, that alerts you when, when your name is posted on the web. So uh, it's just a, a helpful tool, I think, to know uh, what's, uh, what's out there on the web about you. Or what other people are saying about you. Right. Um, criminal convictions. We, we had uh, one doctor several years ago that had a Medicare fraud conviction, and I, I learned about it when he disclosed it to me. He said, Mr. Heideman, here, I'm going to send you a packet of information, and it contains in there the summary of court rulings, uh, Daubert court rulings they were, uh, where other attorneys have had to handle my Medicare fraud conviction, and you can use this information as you see fit. So he disclosed it to me, and we were able to deal with it, um, uh, but it was nice that he just, I, I found out about it beforehand rather than at his deposition. All right. Uh, mistake number eight, lack of familiar, that's lack of familiarity with Daubert. Daubert can be an intimidating topic, uh, confusing at times, I, I, I suspect, and really it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. We're not going to deal with it with a whole lot of uh, specificity today. Um, but generally, as expert witnesses, you need to be familiar with, with the Daubert standard. Uh, we put on, on the slide here three cases that are really important in that area, uh, in, and the middle one obviously is, is the Daubert case, um, and what Daubert's all about is determining or helping courts determine your methodology for arriving at your opinions uh, and, and how sound that methodology is. Generally, Daubert wants uh, to only put forward scientific evidence that is reliable. Uh, it's, it's, it's the gatekeeping uh function of the courts to keep out junk science or opinions that are based on speculation or or unreliable methodology. And uh, Daubert's, a Daubert motion can be made early on in a case where the, your opinion can be front and center early on. And those opinions are recorded. They're recorded in the unpublished or published decisions of the U.S. District Court. Uh, they're also published on uh, some other private databases that collect these kinds of uh, Daubert motion hearing results and uh, reliability results. And so you want to make sure that if your opinions have ever been excluded in prior cases, you tell the attorney about it because the other side is probably going to figure out a way to get access to that and find out, even if we disagree with how another court ruled on the reliability of your methodology or of your opinion, they may try and use that information against you. So uh, forewarned is forearmed. Daubert, what Daubert, the Daubert case does is it sets forth these standards that are uh, these uh, factors that help the court determine whether your testimony or opinions are reliable. Keep in mind, Daubert is a federal standard. It applies in federal courts. Uh, different states and jurisdictions have different standards. Uh, Missouri has not adopted the same Daubert standards, a little different. Now, Daubert is really only going to come into play in, in unusual areas. There are very well-settled areas of engineering, and medicine, and physics where you're not going to have Daubert problems. But any time, uh, in, for instance, in the medical arena, if you have a case involving a syndrome, uh, you might have some Daubert issues. If you have a novel area of science, you're going to have some Daubert issues. And so uh, just be aware of that and make sure that you discuss with the attorney that hires you if there are any particular reliability issues that you need to be concerned with in your methodology of arriving at your opinions. All right, on to number nine. Uh, number nine is kind of the, uh, the uh, uh, very similar to the fee issue. Uh, sometimes uh, an expert witness has an unbalanced opinion history. That means 
uh, you know, the expert witness typically only renders opinions or works for defense with the defense attorneys or for plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, just like with fee issues, you just want to tell it the way it is, tell the truth, and don't waffle. Um, you don't necessarily have to be only like to justify for the defendant. I think it it is credible to say, you know, I only prefer to testify in defense cases. Uh, you know, the, uh, the the fact is you might say I, I get paid more regularly if I testify in defense cases or, or, you know, what have you. I think that whatever your reasoning is for wanting to do one over the other, um, just announce it, and I don't think you need to apologize for it. I mean, it is a, it can be a problem. I mean, a jury may perceive you, if you only testify for plaintiffs, as being somebody that will say anything if you're given money. Likewise, if you're, you're somebody that only testifies for defendants, a jury could possibly say, well, you wouldn't find fault with anything. Um, and that's why we, we would encourage you to consider, um, stepping out of your comfort zone if you are an expert that prefers to testify for the plaintiff and you're asked by a defendant to look at a case, take a look at it. It might be one for you. I mean, the goal is to make yourself marketable, and I think having a balanced opinion history uh, in many cases makes you more marketable than in, if you're just known for testifying uh, for one particular side of a case. Well, because it protects you from that perceived bias by the jury or the... You know, and, and our goal in, in talking about these, these ten mistakes is to enhance your credibility, and we're going to conclude with that later on, but... You, you become more credible if you have a, a more balanced opinion history. But if you don't, don't apologize for it. Just say it the way it is. All right. The final uh, mistake we wanted to cover today was dealing with hypotheticals. And this specific, this typically comes up in those cross-examination depositions that we talked about earlier. Uh, key on these, first thing, how to deal with them, is answer the hypothetical. Nothing is more annoying than an expert that will refuse to answer a hypothetical question. They'll just say, well, I'm not here to offer opinions on facts that I haven't reviewed beforehand. That is crazy because you're the expert, not me. If I give you a sufficient set of facts upon which you can base a scientific opinion and I offer them and ask you to assume them as true, don't worry about how that might impact the jury or the case. Just answer the question. Well, and it's not its not that it's annoying to the attorney. It may be, but the bigger issue is that it's going to be annoying to the jury. If it, You know, the jury wants to hear from you as the expert witness. So uh, that's the big reason. Don't worry, don't worry so much about annoying the attorney. Uh, don't annoy the jury. Ultimately, the judge, if, if called upon, is going to order you probably to answer the hypothetical, and you don't want the case to go that far. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't distinguish the hypothetical posed to you from the facts that are at issue in the case. Uh, this is another chance for you to show your expertise, you know. Uh, if, if you are, uh, you know, an accident reconstructionist and the attorney asks you, you know, skid marks are this long, uh, how fast and they were going, or how fast were they going, you can say, well, I don't know. Uh, and the reason I don't know is because I don't know what the uh, coefficient of friction is in this case. And then you could say, you know, if I had that information, I could offer an opinion, but I'm not able to until we get that. And I doubt, perhaps, that the opposing counsel has taken his drag stick out and measured the coefficient of friction. So that would deal with that hypothetical right there. Uh, the other thing is, is that oftentimes you need additional facts. And one of the objections that we as attorneys use in objecting to a hypothetical is we'll say, I object. That question contains insufficient facts upon which to base a hypothetical answer. Um, and if there are additional facts, I don't think that I would feel too afraid to point that out um, because ultimately the attorney is going to continue to push the point until you give him an answer. You might as well make sure that you make him consider all of the facts that you would need to offer a hypothetical answer. But the key here is you, you do want to answer the question, um, and, and these are just ways that you also cover your bases by answering the question to preserve uh, to preserve your opinion. So we want to jump in, do a little more Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. All right. Fees are always a fun topic. Uh, Stephen asks, uh, what do you think about asking for your money up front before giving a deposition? Stephen, um, times are tight. We're in the Depression. I think that is a great idea. Uh, if somebody wants to, to take your deposition, they're going to have to pay you sooner or later, and I don't think your cash flow should be dependent upon uh, when your payable runs through the, the attorney's uh, um, you know accounting department. 
I think that it's common. I don't think you should apologize for it. And particularly where you've got a minimum fee, uh, if, if, if the attorney decides he doesn't want to pay you, you're going to be in the situation where uh, you might be involved in litigation when, in fact, you were just trying to do your job. So I think that money before depositions is, is okay uh, if appropriate. I don't know that I do it in all cases. Sometimes it can leave a bad taste in, in an attorney's mouth. But if you communicate, and we keep preaching communication, if you communicate that you've had bad experiences with getting paid in a timely manner, that's going to explain why you, you need to get all or some of your money up front. Uh, Scott wrote in and asked uh, asked about an awkward silence that happens after the attorney raises an objection. Uh, he doesn't know whether he's, he, whether he's supposed to answer the question or not. Um, unless, like we said, unless the attorney specifically instructs you not to answer the question, once the attorney has raised the objection, just answer the question. The purpose of, of objecting in deposition is just to preserve those specific objections so that the judge can rule on them later. Later at trial, not that day or that week, and so we, we just object and then we get the answer on the record, and if it's later determined to be objectionable, then obviously your answer wouldn't be heard by the jury. Uh, so that's, that's kind of why we, we, we recommend that you not look at your attorney and say, should I answer that? Because they'll, they'll either instruct you not to answer or you need to answer. Uh, Howard said that he tends to review more plaintiff cases, um, and he wonders why that's the case. Um, I don't know. Uh, perhaps there's something about that that makes you more appealing to plaintiffs. It may be that once you start testifying as, you know, for more plaintiffs, uh, attorneys or for, you know, on the plaintiff side, you may build up a reputation as a plaintiff's attorney. Uh, defendants may shy away from that, be afraid you may render an opinion that's adverse to them. So More recently, we're seeing, uh, since we're in the depression, I'm, I'm kidding, recession, depression, um, that, that defendants or insurance companies um, are tending to not bring in experts earlier in the case, that they're waiting until later in the case to see how it progresses, whether or not summary judgment's granted in their favor, uh, before going out and investing the money in uh, uh, an expert. We think that that's not a good idea, especially if you're a defense expert. Who wants to be brought in at the end of a case after the die is cast and the theory of the case is developed? It would be far better to be brought in earlier, and we'd encourage all of the experts that are working with uh, defense lawyers to, to let them know that you'll be able to do your best work if you were involved early. Uh, Arthur has a, uh, an interesting suggestion. He wanted to know uh, regarding video depositions whether – be appropriate to request or demand that the deposing attorney is also shown on camera. Um, he says, I think their theatrics and rude behavior should also be seen by the jury. Comments? Excellent point. Uh, we, we just had the other day uh, a, a, a potential opportunity for impeachment come up, and we thought that we would tell the video uh, uh, deposition person to bring two cameras and put one on <laughs> put one on the opposing counsel and one on the witness so that we could we could watch him squirm when the witness gave this one particular answer not necessarily to show the jury but just for our own amusement uh, ultimately it's a matter of cost um, we want to be in tight with the camera on the deponent during the deposition and unless somebody pays to have two cameras where you you, sometimes they do that. I've seen many video depositions where they'll have the witness's face with the attorney's face on it. Uh, it's a choice of the guy that's writing the check, whether or not to do that. I, I'm not aware of it being required in any of the jurisdictions that I practice in, which are Illinois and Missouri and in the federal court system, uh, but um, I, I, I think it is optional. Uh, somebody asked about what, you know, what, when they're misquoted. Uh, you know, if, if you've made some kind of statement and then later somebody else misquotes you, um, you know, the way that I would deal with that as an expert witness is, is I would only deal with it if it's brought up at deposition. If the other attorney says, look, it says here that, that you made this statement, um, you know, if you're aware of those ahead of time, you can either bring where you initially made that statement or, you know, then you can bolster that, uh, deal with that at deposition and say, no, that's not at all what I said. This is what I said. He uh, he made a uh, there was a misstatement there, and uh, and just move on. Um, following up on my earlier statement about social security numbers, uh, one of the participants asked, in the day of identity theft, um, aren't social security numbers off limits, especially of family members? 
answer to that is maybe. It really depends on your judge and jurisdiction. Um, oftentimes, so much information that we can get through discovery is is linked to a witness's social security number that many judges will require that they be produced, but will enter what's called a protective order that the information that's given not be disclosed to third parties that don't have a need to know. So. I think if that question came up as a witness or an attorney, I'd say, you know what, we'll provide that information, knowing that if it went before the judge, they'd probably order it, but we want everybody to voluntarily agree to a protective order, and that information will be redisclosed. Ultimately, if you decide not to answer, that, that certainly could be debatable. It's not necessarily black and white, but I think that most courts uh, that I've practiced in front of tend to um, require the production of that information. Probably not so far as requiring the production of an expert's family member's social security numbers without some kind of a prior showing as to how it was reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. Uh, Faye, is a, Faye is an actuary, uh, was working on a case, and only wants to know, you know, what the life, what the, uh, wants Faye's opinion on life expectancy, and the attorney doesn't want to pay for pay to understand the uh, the entire case. Uh, that may come up. I think, you know, one of the things we didn't mention is, there's a, you know, one of the easiest ways to get an idea of what the case is about is to read the petition or complaint that's been filed and to read the uh, read the answer that was filed by the defendant. Uh, they take very little time. And really, you know, you can, you can get a lot of understanding about the theory of the case and what the case is about just by talking to the attorney. Um, you know, it... it for, as an attorney, I would want to hear in that case from the, from my expert, you know, you know, if I'm working with you, Faye, I want Faye to say, look, I can do my job, but I, it would be much better if you could tell me what this case is about. Uh, it may, may it may take a little more time, but it'll be worth it in the long haul. But it depends on the complexity of the case. I mean, if the case that Faye's referring to is litigation that's been going on for four years involving 18 attorneys and 29 parties. Uh, it might be difficult for the attorney to bring her up to speed efficiently uh, on life expectancy. More often, um, you know, I think that the case that she might be referring to would be one where if she just said, look, I can't jump in until I read the petition and the answer, uh, is that a problem? And I doubt any attorney would say no because, goodness gracious, it couldn't take more than an hour to read a petition or an answer no matter how thick they are. Uh, and we'll probably wrap up with a couple more questions here, but... Um, Paul asks that, you know, in his retainer agreement, he says that he's to be paid door to door. Um, and the opposing counsel wants to have the deposition an hour away from his residence, um, uh, from the office, and only wants to pay for the depot time. Uh, that's one of those cases where you might want to get your fee up front, um, and, and say, look, this is how I charge, um, and, uh, and, and that's just the way it is. And it's one of those deals where you have to be upfront about your fees and honest. And be careful what you ask for because I've had that situation come up before where, you know, I wanted to take the deposition in, in a metropolitan area near an airport and the uh, expert was going to charge me $500 an hour to drive two hours there. And my response was, well, if your policy is portal to portal, that's fine. I'll be taking it at your house. What time should I be there? <laughs> Uh, and he quickly said, well, I'll tell you what, since that's the case, I certainly don't want to have to give my deposition at my, my home or at my office. You know, they, you say, fine, I'll come to your, he was a practicing, uh, expert. I said, fine, we'll take it in your office. Well, you don't want your clients or your patients seeing a bunch of lawyers tracing in to take your deposition. It leaves a bad, bad impression. So, it's something I think that can be worked out, but I think you need to explain it or maybe even have alternating reasonable charges for the travel time, you know. Uh, but it's a personal choice, and I certainly wouldn't fault any expert for doing that one way or another. All right. Uh, let's, you know, as, as expert witnesses, um, the way that, that we think about it, as expert witnesses, you are really selling two things. One, you're selling your knowledge and expertise, your ability to form opinions uh, based on certain facts. But the other thing that you're you're selling, and that's what today's webinar was really about, is your credibility, uh, the, your effectiveness in being believable in front of a jury or a judge or another fact finder. And credibility is what it all comes down to. I mean, it's far easier to, to maintain your credibility than to rehabilitate your credibility. And uh, keeping it is, is just a matter of, of keeping a couple of these basic things in mind when giving your deposition because uh, unlike – 
many things in life, the deposition is the only creature that we have that records everything that you say, and it's presumed to be 100% accurate and under oath. So uh, uh, with that, I think we will conclude, and uh, thank everybody for attending. We certainly have a good time putting these together, and, and we appreciate the interest everybody shows, and we'll turn it back over to Matt. Okay, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your effort um, for this third part of our introductory uh, expert webinar series. I hope that all of our attendees found this series um, to be informative and helpful in their practice. Uh, we have posted uh, the previous two webinars on in the Knowledge Center of the TASA website, so I would uh, direct you to there if you're looking for an archive of the previous two webinars. And we'll be putting an archive of this webinar up in the Knowledge Center of the TASA Group's website, www.tassanet.com, in the next hour or so. We'll also be sending out an email with the slides of the presentations and uh, the, uh, record, the archive recording of the presentation. Please feel free to share um, any of the information that was presented in today's webinar with your friends and your colleagues. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, please feel free to email me at mhide at tassinet.com. Otherwise, we will probably take the rest of the summer off, um, though I'm not 100% sure on that, and possibly start up with a new series in the fall for experts. So please look in your in inbox um, in the coming months for an announcement from the TASA group. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time, and thank you to our distinguished panelists, Craig and Nathan. Again, you guys did a tremendous job with the presentation, and I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you guys so much. Bye.